Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining in today. So today, I'm going to talk to you about the evolution pattern of social technical system. Uh, so I'm going to start with a story. And I'm pretty sure that a lot of you have already heard this story. So you have a new competitive threat or a big opportunity that emerges. Either it's, uh, you need to have be competitive uh, on the market, or you need to deliver a new customer value, or you just need to reduce costs. You create a strategic initiative, you appoint your best people, and then you make a plan for change. So you will define what is your state, the as is, the target, you will define the roadmap and what are the constraints and even the triggers to start. The change does happen, not fast enough, not effective enough, but it does happen, slowly, sometimes painfully. And you get stuck somewhere. And then, your value get lost, and your system drift back to default status. And sometimes you even struggle to survive. What happened? You have all the planning, you have uh, the people, you have the strategy, everything was set on track, and then change didn't really happen. So, show of hands, how many of you can relate to this? Nice. <laughs> I'm not the only one that said this. <laughs> so, this is the TLDR. The talk is finished now. Your social technical system is not aligned. <laughs> That's it, you can leave if you want to. <laughs> But if you uh, want to, you can stick for um, the details. We're going to dig deep into the story, what really happened. So we're going to start a little bit of theory. A social technical system. I've always had a little bit of difficulty to define what is a social technical system simply. Because in your social technical system, you have different elements who are intertwined. You have your strategy, you have your organization, you have your technology, and you have the culture and the process. And all of these will create a single and a whole system. And it reminds me of the human brain. So you have on the left side, your, your left hemisphere is Cartesian, is analytical, is rigor, and it's logical. And on the right hemisphere, you have the emotion, the creativity, the improvising, and the intuition. Which reminds me of the social technical system. You have the human and you have the technology. And this is, have been introduced in the 60s by Malvin Kenway. So the law of Kenway, and I think that lots of uh, people here uh, knows it, any organization that designs a system will inevitably produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization communication structure. It means that the way that you communicate with each other will define the structure of the architecture that you are creating. And really, what I want to present in this talk is we only have one system, not the organization from one, one hand and the architecture from another hand, so it's one system. And when you start to design the system, so you're going to focus on your technology, your technical assets, and the people that are surrounding and creating these assets. And you think that's going to be simple, and you'll only have like uh, some links to draw from one software to another, and you have your design of your architecture. But actually, what you really discover 
is that there are lots of communication going outside of your system among the people that are developing your system. So there are some communications that are fluent, some are other communications that are not good enough, and there is some personal character that plays in here. So you have people who get along, people who you cannot put together in the same room, and when you have such situation, how can you create or how can you design an architecture? This is why we use generally patterns. And now I'm quoting Gregor Hope in his um, presentation of enterprise uh, integration pattern, where he defined a pattern as a recurrent problem. So it's observed from real world experience when I said who have already seen this scenario, you already uh, felt the relevance, but it's coming from also your real world experience, which means that it is a pattern. So a pattern describe a problem and find a solution for this problem. Sometimes it's a teaching and it can give the why and the how. And finally, you name your pattern to create a language for people, for other people to use these patterns. And in this talk, we're going to use the system archetype as the reference of the pattern that we are using. And you may wonder, we have pattern, we have archetype, two different terms and difficult terms. So patterns are very diverse, so are very different, as we said, that can come from, um, considering that our social technical system is a complex system, it can come from people, it can come from technology, it can come from the process, it can come from decision making, from different factor. And considering that we have lots of pattern, in order to abstract and to be able to reason about the problem that we have, we use archetype. Archetype are a high level description of a bunch or a given patterns. So to read you the definition that have been given by William Brown, system archetype are casual feedback structure formed by combination of the reinforcing and the balancing feedback loop. So we will have two feedback loops. One is reinforcing and the other one is balancing. It will exhibit characteristic outcome behavior over time. And overall, in, um, in this research paper, William have described 10 archetypes. I think in the keynote, you have already seen this archetype today. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to focus on two archetypes, which are the limits to growth and the eroding goals. Let's deep dive into our modernization example. So let's consider an example of two insurance companies. So you have the first company who is more like startup, optimized for efficiency, and the second company, who is an E-type company, so that's a large corporation, which is optimized for strategic business. So the first company, Company A, the joy of the youth, are more oriented experimentation, novelty, and innovation. And they are optimized for efficiency, they have a very fast flow, they have a remarkable delivery performance, they have an autonomy of decision making and the cutting edge software. Company B, on the other hand, declining fame, have a maturity and stability on the market. It's optimized for strategic business. It has a high notoriety on the B2B market. It's important and have a client, uh, client base. The decision making is rather top down. So we have a bunch of people that decide for the people that are delivering. And we have a legacy system with model or architecture. However, we have problems with client satisfaction. So the current software is no longer responding to the client needs. And this is why the company B 
is thinking about acquiring the company A. In order to, you know, integrate their youth in their ways of working, in order to have their software and to substitute their legacy system with the new software, and to gain more competitive edge in the market. So, we will rewire the, um, the story. You will define your integration strategy. And so for the strategy, you have three types. First of all, either it's going to be fully integrated. It means that the company, company B will take over the company A. We can have some little adaptation because uh, it's interesting in the company uh, B. But it's, the comp it's interesting in the company A, the startup, but the company B will be the target of this integration. The second type is the best of, bre uh, the best of breed integration. It means we're going to assess both of the um, company and see which way works the best, and we're going to select that. The third one is a greenfield, is we're going to start all over. We're going to all define together from scratch. So, then you're going to appoint your best team. For the best team, we will have two uh, groups. You'll have the decision-making group, which on the top level, you only call them when there are very strategic decisions to be made that will define your direction, define your business outcome. And the second group is the day-to-day -day operation. And you'll make a plan for change. So, considering your as-is, you have your first company, the company A, the startup with the, uh, the new technology, cutting-edge technology, and the second company who's a little bit uh, uh, mature on the market and have legacy system. And you need to define your target system. To do this, you need to decide about three different areas. First of all, business, then technology, and the ways of working. Let's assess this. We have the first company, company A versus the company B. So, the first gap analysis about strategy have provided that the company A, the startup, is not doing so well in business. It means that it has, it is popular on, um, on the B2C market, on the insurance market, but it remains a niche market. It's not that well known from insurance company. And it only have an emergent uh, business, it's still in discovery mode, it's not that uh, rigorous as um, the company A, and it have a limited business vision. The company B, on the other hand, is very established on um, the B2B market. It has a strong ownership of their business domain and her client portfolio. And, however, as we have seen, the reason why they are acquiring this company, it, they are not very, the client are not very satisfied with the technology given and provided by the company B. The second area of analysis is our technology. So as um, we have said, the company A has a cutting-edge technology. It's, let's say, AI-based custom personalization with client-native application. They have a modular architecture, but they can enhance on their um, technical depth resorption, and they can enhance also on their end-to-end -end testing. From the other hand, the, uh, the company B have a legacy system. Uh, it has obsolescence risk. It's an unpromised hosting. It has a monolith architecture that turns out not to be very modular after all. And it has a recurrent problem impacting the service availability. And the third area of analysis is the way of working. So for the startup company, they are performance-oriented company. They are very agile. They are uh, fluent. They have a, an efficient flow of delivery. They 
They have established a dynamic where they are accelerating and growing. They have a collaborative leadership. They have empowered team who take the decision within their team. They don't need to, uh, to go with a small decision to the leadership. But however, um, uh, an alert regarding uh, the company, uh, A, is they must retain the key talent because it's, they're not very well on documentation and you have the key talent, the founder who have all the knowledge in their head, so they are a value to ensure the continuity of the business. On the other hand, the company B, in this case, it's more rule-oriented, so it's a big company, you have a lot of process to respect. You need to, to do this in order to gain governance all over your um, different department. So you have a directive leadership, so it's more oriented towards planning, organization, respect of the rules. And um, it have a lack of initiative among um, uh, team members, and they they have a top-down decision. So when you, you are not that, uh, um, you, you don't take a decision on daily basis on what you do, you will lack sometimes initiative to deliver more. And we have discovered that there's an important turnover. So now, the decision of the strategy has been made. So what are they going to do? They're going to do the best of bread. So this is our target. What does it mean? For the business, we're going to choose the way. Uh, we're going to go more from uh, with the company B because it's more mature. It's, uh, it's the relevant uh, choice to do. Then uh, for the technology, we will choose the cutting edge technology of the startup. And finally, for the way of working, we're still not sure what to do about this. And why is this? We have appointed the people. We will launch a process as it has been already been launched. However, the culture, we are not very sure what culture we're going to put in this uh, situation. And change does happen, not fast enough, not effective enough, but it does happen. And we hit a challenge and we hit a constraint. We need to modernize the architecture. This is a program that has been already started with five working streams. So the first work stream is new. You need to move to cloud, this new service that um, the company B have. And you need to re-architecture your monolith. The second stream is you need to adapt the new company, the startup company, to the business use cases of the company B in order to be able to use their software. Then you will have to decommission the adaptive service. So both of these streams are there for the transition because the modernization and the move to cloud will take so long. So we need a transition into uh, how to continue the day-to-day -day work till we will have the move to cloud finalized. And of course, you need to maintain the current, uh, the as is maintained for your company. Uh, a and B. So these are the work stream of the architecture that we have launched. And one year pass. And the second year pass, and still nothing. And the third year pass, and the architecture is not yet modernized. Why is this? You go back to your first point, your value gets lost and your system drifts back to its initial status. And even worse, the company post-integration is hemorrhaging money. You are losing money and you are in state of alert and you don't know what to do. And once again, we ask ourselves, what happened? So let's rewire it. 
of course, your social technical system is not aligned, but how? Why it was not aligned? Remember the decision that we did not make about the ways of working? Well, it was that what happened. And we was looking for the technology to deliver new value. Well, as Melvin Canway said, both of them are connected. Your architecture is a copy of the organization communication structure. So if you don't decide on one way of um, how you're going to do things, how you're going to communicate your change, how you're going to organize your system, how you're going to um, bring these people to work together as a team, it will impact your technology. So let's see from this lens. Let's assess the problem from this lens. And to do so, we will use system patterns. One, limit to growth archetype. So the limit to growth archetype states that there are two feedback loop. The one is reinforcing process and accelerating toward growth. And the second one, the balancing process will absolutely limit the growth of your first feedback loop. What does it mean? So you will put the effort. You will get a result. And if the result, if satisfying, you will continue. This is your reinforcing loop. However, sometimes from the, res the result, you will get past. So you'll have the forces coming from your balancing loop with some slowing action. And it's your slowing action who's going to limit the growth that you had in your first um, feedback loop. Let's put it in an example. So on the first feedback loop, you have the startup with its way of experimentation. So they have an established flow, they have uh, worked toward their growth, and they have achieved a very interesting result. On the other hand, you have the maturity and the company B who has already her technical issue that is preventing its growth. And the fact of merging or integrating both of the system together, the company B, with its technical issue and with its problem of related to slowing down the system, will inevitably impact the growth of your startup. And this is why your value get, get lost. You didn't manage to have the balancing forces to keep the momentum going. Let's the, assess our system from our architecture side in this time. And for this, we're going to use a second pattern. This pattern is the eroding goals. So the eroding goals state that there is a gap between a goal and the actual condition that can be resolved in two ways. The first one is you will correct your action toward achieving these goals. You need to adjust either your environment or uh, adjust um, the condition within or coming from outside your system. Or the second one is lowering your goal. It means that you say, this is a goal that's very far to be reached. Let's lower down this goal and see where it comes from here. The problem with the second solution is that it will deteriorate your performance. It is inevitable. Whenever you're going to set low um, standards for your goal, it will, uh, over the time, deteriorate your performance. Let's visualize this. So you have, at first, your reinforcing loop. 
In the second one, you're balancing group. You have a goal, you have detected a gap, either you will adjust and you, um, you'll put pressure to lower your goal or you will have an action to improve the condition of your actual state. And this is um, the dynamic that they will continue. Let's consider in our use case what happened. So for our people that have been working on this integration, we have the group of the decision making and we have the group of the day-to-day -day operation. So, the group of decision-making came and provides, this is our goal. The second group need to apply this goal. The second group, so they get hit by reality, by how uh, the technical issue, they, don't can, they can't advance and they can't progress as fast as they, um, they want to. So, they come back to uh, the first a group and they say we are having a problem, there is a gap, the gap is your technical issue, we need to readjust the goal. And this would explain why year after year there is nothing that have come up, that you don't have your technology or your architecture modernization, uh, because you are setting a goal lower and lower and you are not adjusting well enough to reach your goal. The other problem that we have discovered in this case is there is no prioritization. And you have too much workload and not enough people. So this is a very common mistake. So for example, the day-to-day -day, um, operation, we have four people. And for these four people, we have five work stream. And for each work stream, we have affected almost like every different person. For the, the first two ones, the move to cloud, to cloud, which is a big uh, subject, a big working stream, we need the expertise of everybody, from the people that are coming from company A and company B. For the second one, the adaptation for B2B business, we need experts from the company A, the startup, and we need one or two experts from the company B to explain what are the business use case and to be able to adjust and modify um, the architecture uh, for these new business use cases. For the decommissioning, we only have the team from the company B and for as is maintains, at first we put one, one person and then, but because the other person is always on other meeting or it's needed somewhere or it's emergency there. So you need a backup to help him uh, maintain what uh, he's supposed to do. But it, did not, it, did, it didn't work. It didn't work. You have three main, um, you have, uh, sorry, five big project launching with too much people and there is nothing that is prioritized before the other. Everything is important, which means nothing is important. So this is the question. How will you make the decision? How will you prioritize? And here we're going to use the information flow to understand what happened. Because what is expected from these people in the decision-making status or leadership um, or uh, either if it is on from strategic point of view or from an operational point of view, we need to have a clear decision, we need to have a clear goals, clear principles and a clear direction towards we are heading. What we have discovered, the people in the first uh, line, so they belong to the company A, the startup. So the communication was so much easier. They are used to work with each other. It was so easy, but however, they are not in the same team anymore. They are not working together anymore. And in the same, uh, the same uh, thing, we had the people from company B, they had a very great interaction, the flow was very fluent, because they know each other, they are used to talk to each other. And the problem is within 
this little bubble of decision making where you put people coming from different backgrounds, from different culture, and you ask them to take the decision, but they don't know how to communicate with each other. That's the problem. And we have used information flow to detect the problem of communication that happens in this situation. So now we need to assess our cultural gap between the company A and the company B, considering that it's the origin of our problem. Remember the way of working, so the analysis that we done and we didn't really focus on it and we just say, okay, so this is an analysis and we're gonna see how we're gonna uh, make it. Let's uh, do the work day by day and then we will adjust. When you have a company who's performance oriented versus a company who is rule oriented, you don't reason on the same level. The performance oriented, we want to get ahead, we want to get things done, and it's the performance toward um, that goal that they are heading was the most important one. When you are in a rule-oriented culture, it's the processes and the rules who are the most important. So the focus, it's not the same. So you're... You are not reasoning on the same level, you are not acting towards the same goal. Collaborative leadership versus directive leadership, we need both of these types of leadership because it complements each other. The collaborative will bring people to work together versus the directive will set the planning, will set the next step, you know exactly what to do and you will not have to think too much how to do it, no, nor when to do it. The lack of initiative, I would say that is a consequence when you don't give enough autonomy to people and enough responsibility. If each time you're gonna bring an initiative and no, it's not your place to say that, or why are you working on that, or no, it's not, it's not how things get done here, you will get demotivated and you will no longer propose anything new. And the fact that the people want to quit this job, the fact that you have an important turnover, is very uh, indicative on the culture um, of your organization because people really don't leave places. People leave people. They cannot work with these people or it does not any longer um, see themselves growing or performing or going somewhere else in this situation or in this company. So this is why they leave. And now let's focus on a specific point that it has not been discussed during the integration, which is the culture. The culture means the value, the leadership and the events. But let's deep dive into this. What is culture? What makes the culture? And for this, I'm going to use a definition that I, I saw here last year in DDD Europe in a hands-on. And it was very interesting, this new interaction with what culture is. So culture also is a pattern. It's a pattern of assumption. It gets invented, discovered, and developed by a group of people in learning to cope with its problem, either from external adaptation or from internal integration. It has worked well enough to be considered valid, and it is taught, so it's something that you are teaching to others as the new and correct way to act, to perceive, to think, and to feel regarding your relationship with this problem. So culture is very important. Culture is not something that you has. It's not something an organization has. It's something that an organization is. It's the identity of the company. And if you don't decide on what identity you're gonna have, 
I don't know what's left. And here's where I call on all the leaders in this room. Leadership is the management of the culture. You are responsible for the culture that you are creating in your teams. You're setting the example, you're setting the way of working, you're setting the way of communication, you're setting what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, how to react to a problem versus another. You are the manager of the culture. And in our case, what leaders fail to do in the example that I've shown to you is to enable a common culture, is to for the people that are, they are working with to feel that they belong to, to there. And we are using another model to assess what a culture is or what an organizational culture is, and it's the Westroom model that is based on the structure of the information flow. And so this model is using several layers. So how you are cooperating with each other. What is the role of a messenger in a culture? What are the responsibility given to the different member of your team? Do you need to do bridging or every people is able to communicate with each other? How you treat failure? It's a very important indicator of organization culture because it will give either the ability to people to try new things, to experiment, to find you the next innovation that you're looking for, or it will restrict people into the small boxes that you're putting them in. And finally, novelty. So, what this company could have done better? First of all, they could have managed better the change. And this is another workshop that I've assisted to last year here in DDD Orp, where I discovered the two loop of change. So the concept of the two loop of change is to prepare for the emergence of the new system. So you will have two, two systems. The first one is your dominant system, and the second one is the emergent system. Let's consider, in our case, the dominant system is the company B. It has her notoriety on the market, has the power, and she's acquiring the company A, the startup. First of all, you need to assign the pioneers. The pioneers, as we see in our story, there was the people that you have assigned to work on your integration. Uh, what went wrong in that integration is the fact that you didn't create a network around these pioneers. So these pioneers, they need to connect with each other, they need to work toward one goal, they have the same beliefs, they have the same attraction, they have the same direction, and you connect them, you nurture them, and bit of bit, it creates a community of practice. And this is what I love about DDD Europe. It's a community of practice. This is why you, you came here every year, because it nourishes you. It, you. You can learn, you can see things from different and new perspectives. Once your system and your community is strong enough, then you can just layer through in your emergent system and be the leaders that people will choose to follow. This is how you can secure, really, your transition. Another thing is to compose your pioneers team with diverse leadership types. So there is no right or wrong way to lead. There are people, they have their own character, and they have their own traits. So we can have the visionary type. Visionary type are people who are very creative. 
very um, into the discovery mode. They can, they don't, they, they don't, they are not scared with the chaos, with the unknown and the dark places where, oh, you lose your balances. It's where they thrive and where they find the next uh, innovation that will change maybe your company. The incubating type are the people that the leader that will create a hosting environment for younger generation or younger leaders, the people who are not yet in leadership, but I, they have this specific way of working that they, they really believe in their idea. So the incubating type is the one who's providing the safety for them to work on this idea. The directive type are very good at planning, at setting the goals, at knowing exactly what is the next step. When you're in a group of people and you don't know where the direction is, you always, there's someone who say, hey, so it's from there, follow me. And he just do it with so much confidence that you say, okay, he know where he's going, I'm gonna follow him. And finally, the collaborative type. The collaborative type is what I think the DDD community is all about. Is the fact that creating architecture together, creating system together, having the tools and the means to do so. And this is what brings me to my next recommendation. They could, could have used DDD tools, event storming, team topology to collaborate. So when you use an event storming, you will have your big picture of your architecture, you have your domains, your business aligned, and you can limit this domain. Then you set your teams, you define the relationship that, uh, that's gonna govern them, and then you do your core domain chart work in order to prioritize and to see where is the real value that you want to create. What is the differentiator that you're aiming for? And finally, context mapping, in order to define the domain interaction with each other. So these are just examples of the strategic DDD and team topology and event storming of what we can use when facing uh, different settings with different people that we didn't work together. I think that DDD tools help smooth this difficult situation. And based on our DDD workshop output, we can revisit the scope and define the priorities. So first of all, either you get an adaptive, you work on what is really, really uh, important for you that you cannot substitute someone else to do it for you with your knowledge regarding some or some system. And of course, you need to be aware of the cognitive load. You just not assign 10 hundred tasks to one person and expecting him to do the job. Three at a time. Let's be rigorous about this. And finally, you have to enable your team culture. If you didn't focus on your culture, you may not, not notice it at first, at the first year, so this is how things is going. This is how we do things here. You will see it on the long run. You will see it when you're trying to acquire new businesses. You will see it when you're trying to reach your goal and you cannot. And this is what culture is important. So my question here for you, what kind of culture are you creating? as a leader. Thank you.